moving on, I want to discuss the various walls and wall motions we can see in the right ventricle. We start with the peristernal long axis view and here you have the overview in this peristernal long axis view where you have the left ventricle, aortic valve, mitral valve and here the parts of the right ventricular beginning out for track, the so-called infundibulum of the right ventricle. Also here you can see that there is a contraction happening. So already in the peristernal long axis, you can see a degree of right ventricular function or impaired right ventricular function. If you use a peristernal view of the right ventricle with an inflow view, we have here the right atrium and the right ventricle, you can watch this in the other videos on the peristernal long axis to see how this view is achieved. You have two more walls you can find and quantify or at least to a degree quantify right ventricular function. So here we have the anterior wall of the right ventricle and if you tilt enough the inferior wall. Moving on to a peristernal short axis view we have here the left ventricle in the center of the image and around the left ventricle is also the right ventricle of course and here we have even more walls to visualize. We have the anterior wall over here, the inferior wall of the here, over here, the inferior wall over here and parts of the free lateral wall of the right ventricle. In a focused four chamber view where you visualize the right ventricle we have the free lateral wall which we are also scanning and interpreting in, for example, strain echocardiography with the free wall strain, or where we measure the Tapsi and the S prime in this region, so the lateral tricuspid annulus. In a subcoastal view, you also have another possibility to visualize parts of the right ventricle, which would be mostly the inferior wall, or depending on how you tilt the transducer, probably also the lateral wall of the right ventricle. And when you rotate the transducer for a subcoastal short axis view, the left ventricle is in the center, we have here again several walls we can identify, the inferior wall, the anterior wall, and the free lateral wall of the right ventricle. So in this all normal and healthy examples, you see that the quantification of right ventricular function or global right ventricular function echocardiography is very often like a puzzle. So you have several walls, the wrapping around the right ventricle, around the left ventricle, which makes it very difficult to visualize and to accurately quantify in its function and also in its size sometimes. Moving on to pathological examples, here we have several loops where we can appreciate that here is definitely a reduction in left ventricular function present. Here we see a hyperechoic interventricular septum. This is a scar, so this is probably ischemic heart disease. And over here we see again the infundibulum of the right ventricle and already in this view the function of the right ventricle seems impaired. So not severely impaired but definitely not normal as we have seen before. In this view we have the peristernal view where we have the inflow of the right ventricle. So this is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle and we do see the right ventricle is definitely dilated and furthermore there is a problem with the tricuspid valve. We will discuss this patient a little bit later. Here's another view where we can see parts of the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve. So it's the same patient with the peristernal right ventricular inflow view where we do see that the pacemaker lead is, I would say, hypermobile. So we do see that the right ventricle is dilated, the function is reduced as well. In this view, we do see a severely thickened wall of the right ventricle, the function is definitely impaired and we have a very prominent moderator band and trabeculations and also papillary muscles and a severely thickened left ventricular myocardium. This is a case of amyloid heart disease. So also evaluating the right ventricle in amyloid heart disease is very important to have an overview of the function and the possible reduction in function and dilatation of the right ventricle. Furthermore, in amyloid heart disease, a common finding you see pericardial effusion. If we continue with this patient and scan the patient from a subcoastal approach, we do see that the myocardium is truly thickened of the left ventricle, but also of the right ventricle. In this view, you would measure the right ventricular myocardium because this is the best overview where you truly have the true extent of left ventricular hypertrophy 
or left ventricular myocardial thickening, as it is the case in amyloid heart disease. In this subcoastal for chamber view, we do see as well that there is a small pericardial effusion. In this subcoastal short axis view, we can appreciate a similar finding. We have a truly severely thickened left ventricle and this truly severely thickened right ventricle as well. So in all these views, you can see several portions and parts of the walls of the right ventricle and quantify not only the size of the chamber, but also the function of the right ventricle and the possible thickening of cardiac walls. Now, after seeing the pathological examples where you have the right ventricle in several views and you are not able to visualize the walls, we have to also figure out which coronary artery is responsible for which part of the right ventricle to supply blood and, of course, oxygen. Well, in the parasternal right ventricular inflow view, as you see it over here, we have here the anterior and the posterior wall, and this is the right coronary artery, the marginal branch, which is responsible for supplying the part of the anterior wall seen over here. The right coronary artery, the posterior descending artery, is responsible for the posterior wall. In case of the infundibulum or the RVOT as seen over here, we have the RCA, the conus branch, and we can see this also in the personal short axis view, what we have seen in the personal long axis view, where we have the right ventricular outflow. So also in this case, we have here the conus branch and the marginal branch partly still seen in this area. Continuing with the five chamber view. So this is a view initially more towards the four chamber view, but then uh, also the aortic valve is visualized. In case of the five chamber view, the really basal part of the interventricular septum is supplied by the conus branch of the right coronary artery. The free lateral wall is supplied by the marginal branch of the right coronary artery and the rest, the moderator band and the parts of the left ventricle we see over here, also the apical regions and the septal regions of the left ventricle are supplied by the left anterior descending artery, so the LAD. If we go to the four chamber view, we do see here the wall motion abnormalities this is most likely supplied by the marginal branch of the right coronary artery. Here, the free lateral wall, you can see over here. And this is the territory of the LED again. And the posterior descending artery of the right coronary artery is supplying in a four chamber view the really basal parts of the interventricular septum. In the right ventricular coronary sinus view, we have again the marginal branch, which is responsible for the lateral wall of the right ventricle, the LED for the apical regions and the septal regions, so the interventricular septum, and partly the posterior descending artery for the more basal parts to the mid parts of the interventricular septum. Keep in mind the left anterior descending artery always supplies this area. It doesn't matter which type of coronary perfusion the patient has.